At this point, we have the third keynote session of the ULAP Multicultural Conflict 2022. The keynote speaker is Professor Shagoda Padhuri from Jawaharlal Nehru University, and the address is titled Bengal, Imagining a Divided Nation. The chair for this session is Professor Shudip Chakraborty, writer, journalist, and visiting professor ULAP. May I request Professor Shudip Chakraborty to kindly introduce our keynote speaker and begin the session, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahak, and uh, welcome, uh, Professor Bhaduri. I hope uh, you join us uh, soon because people are very eager to uh, to listen to you. And I'm a bit of a fanboy, by the way, Professor, of yours. Uh, and uh, for, for reasons that shall soon become obvious, we share several common friends, and it seems several common interests as well in your uh, study about Bengal, Bengali culture and the nation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Uh, Professor Bhajuri, of course, doesn't need much of an introduction, but I have to do so because it is important to reiterate just exactly how accomplished uh, this relatively young academician is. He, of course, is a professor uh, at the Center for English Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University. And he's, he's a widely respected academician who has taught at several universities and colleges uh, in South Asia, of course, and also in Europe, the UK, and North America. And uh, it, it, his areas of interest, and that is, that is why I prefaced my remarks earlier, uh, is uh, really the, the cultural history of colonial Bengal, uh, which is a personal favorite of mine, and translation and comparative, uh, comparative literature studies, among numerous other areas. Uh, he's, of course, the author of several books, uh, the latest of which are Polycoloniality, European Transactions with Bengal from the 13th to the 19th century, which is published by Bloomsbury in 2020, and uh, a book that is due later this year, A Critical History of Bengali Literature, which is to be published by Orion Black Swan. Now, uh, Professor Bhadavi's abstract, I'm sure that you've seen it, is, uh, it, it, it sort of takes us through, when he talks about uh, imagining a divided nation, it takes us through Bengal. He says it himself in the extract, which is essentially a divided nation driven by partition, so on and so forth, which he will elaborate on, not me. And, but what, what strikes me as very interesting are the points that he aims to raise uh, in, in his uh, keynote, uh, which is basically that uh, more beyond the division uh, on the lines of religion, caste, ethnicity, as you read in his uh, abstract within each of the two Bengals, uh, he also asks very, very crucially, do Bengalis across the globe imagine themselves as a nation? And uh, does the globe also imagine Bengal as a sort of what he calls a geographical cultural entity? Uh, and is a common language at the root of it? Uh, so please join uh, us as uh, Professor Bhaduri embarks on a journey of imagining, of I hope mentioning uncomfortable truths and uh, the possible futures of this rainbow nation. Uh, over to you, Professor Bhaduri. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Shudeep, and I'm sure we'll get to interact more. It was wonderful to know that uh, we share common friends. I'm sure we'll have a chat about that sooner than later. So um, without much ado, I'll start my presentation. And I must apologize since you already had access to my abstract that maybe I will not be able to just uh, do justice to the to whatever I promised in my abstract, but that I'll uh, come to um, a, a bit later. I mean, it'll be evident, self-evident in a little more time. But nevertheless, let me just start my presentation and uh, just, uh, sorry, just let me know if you can see my screen. It, it should be visible in... Uh, uh, we are not able to see your screen yet, sir. Yeah, yeah I'm sure uh, you're not yet, but I'm, okay, sorry. I think you should be soon enough. Right. Is it is it visible now? Probably. Yes. Okay. Just give me one minute to resize my window a bit. Right. So great. So now I have uh, started presenting it in the full screen mode. Uh, so evidently, I'm going to talk to you today about Bengal imagining a divided nation. And uh, 
right in front of you, you have a map, a virtual map in a way, because no such Bengal exists per se, the international borders as well as the interstate borders within India ensure that uh, Bengal is a divided nation. And Bengal indeed is a divided nation, an essentially divided nation, as I said in my abstract, because uh, though uh, Bengalis are apparently the third largest ethnic group in the world after the Han Chinese and the Arabs, and Bengali is the sixth most spoken language after, of course, uh, Mandarin and um, Arabic, but also uh, English, Spanish, and Hindi Urdu. But Bengal is a divided nation. And we all do know that about 58% of Bengalis reside in Bangladesh and around 38% in India, leaving the scope for around the remainder of the 4% to be in diaspora. So it's very divided. It's kind of uh, almost, um, though not equally, but significantly 58 and 38 is a very significant proportion. Uh, and of course, the repeated partitions, which we all know, uh, at least thrice has Bengal itself been at the receiving end of our subcontinental partitions. And so there are clearly at least two Bengals, the two Bengals that we always talk about, West Bengal and Bangladesh. But as the map that I've shared with you suggests that uh, these are, they're, they're not just two Bengals, at least Tripura, which is also there uh, in the eastern side, kind of jutted into Bangladesh, and the Borag Valley uh, of Assam, they have Bengali as their official languages. So, uh, of official language. So, uh, evidently, there are many Bengals then, not even two, at least four, even if we go by such uh, geographical, geopolitical units that have Bengali as their official language. But things get further complicated because uh, obviously if we talk about regions where Bengali is the predominantly spoken language and not just the official language, then quite a few parts of adjoining states like Bihar, Jharkhand, Assam, etc. and Andaman Islands, because Bengali is the most spoken language in Andaman Islands also. So if we look at a bigger subcontinental map, we find that not only the two or the four Bengals that one talked about a little while back, where administratively Bengali is indeed the official language, but there are many Bengals. So not just two, not just four, there are uh, actually uh, actually quite a few Bengals. And there is a short sub -note, footnote on the right pane, but that I'll come to later, which is that if we look at the map further, we get to see that uh, there are parts of Bengal, this uh, very northwestern part in the, uh, in the shaded map where pink denotes Bengali being the predominantly spoken language, where clearly the pink spills over to Bihar, Jharkhand, a bit of Assam. But there are parts which are technically in Bengal, the Darjeeling Hills and the Chattogram Hills, which clearly are not shaded in pink, which will lead to another complication. That is the, the uh, evident native presence of people who are not Bengali speakers within this imagined larger territory of Bengal. But that I'll come to a little later. That was the uh, sub footnote, side note that uh, that also popped up but i've moved on to my next bulleted point furthermore the divisions are not just uh, political not administrative there is also religious division and that is something that we've been uh, trying to cope with for quite some time now because 66 percent of bengalis are muslims 33 percent are hindus and around one percent are primarily buddhists and christians so major divisions on grounds of religion also and further divisions also on grounds of caste ethnicity which we are just too aware of to reiterate here. In short, there are divisions. There are divisions galore when it comes to imagining what is it to uh, have a Bengali nation today? What is it to think of a Bengal today? And yet the question is, and that is the question that I precisely uh, like to ask today, in spite of these political and social divisions, are these many Bengals imagined together as one geographic cultural entity, as one nation? That is the overwhelming question. Do we Bengalis across borders, in I mean, placed as we are in different religions and different socio-political categories, do we still, uh, still conceive of ourselves as one possible Bengali nation? And if so, and that is the question that I really want to ask today, how is a divided nation imagined? That is simply put the question that I want to put before you today. Now, obviously, I mean, one would think that probably it is through the commonness of Bengali language, because ultimately it is the same language. But 
Is it the same language? Is Bengali really a unified language? Clearly, if one looks at Greater Bengal, the Greater Bengal that one has put before you, which, uh, which incorporates West Bengal, Bangladesh, Tripura, Borak Valley, but also parts of Assam, Bihar, and Jharkhand, where Bengali is the predominantly spoken language. And here I've used divisions in the upper case because I mean actual divisions. So Presidency Division, Medinipur Division, Bordoman Division, Khulna Division, Rajshahi Division. I mean division as, um, so the color coding is here of divisions. So each, uh, the color also uh, indicates the dialect spoken there. So there are clearly different dialects of Bengali across its different divisions. And these dialects are still affiliates of Bengali, even if Sileti and Chittagonian can be considered, or Rajbongshi for that matter, can be considered separate, separate languages. But nevertheless, they're still dialects which are affiliates of Bengal. But as we do know that there are so many other languages which are spoken in what is conceived of the, as this greater Bengal, which have no connection whatsoever with Bengali language. They're not even affiliates. And they belong to other language families altogether, Austroasiatic, like Santali, like Khasi, uh, and of course, Tibeto Burman majorly. We all know Kokborok, we all know uh, Marma, we, all, uh, we are all aware of Garo, uh, Dravidian, like Kuruk, etc. So uh, th the point is that if it is so completely divided, and if it's so, uh, I mean, and if we are talking in the context of mother language itself, then if we imagine Bengal in terms of the monolith of one language Bengali, then do we not run the risk of devouring these minority ethnic mother languages? And that is a very, very important question. So then where, where are we? we? So originally we thought that, okay, so we have one, one thing to latch on to, namely the commonality of Bengali language. But clearly Bengali language also does not become necessarily that block, because that itself is problematic. That itself is a, a hegemonic tool. Is uh, I mean, if we monolithize it, we end up into other dissensions, other divisions, and which is not really productive. So now to enter the moot question that I want to raise in my presentation today, how can a divided nation then imagine itself? My point is that this imagination has to happen through its differences, not in spite of its differences, not by erasing its differences, but through its pluralities, rather than giving in to some kind of a homogenizing majoritarianism. And therefore, this imagination, when we want to imagine our nation, the Bengali nation, Bengal itself as a nation, in spite of and through its differences and divisions, obviously, it has to be one that accommodates the other, that is responsive to the other, that is inclusive of the other. And that goes without saying. So what I mean to suggest is uh, that we have to have an ethical imagination and uh, imagination being played with as indeed the, the, the concept note of this conference itself has played with imagination, so to say. So an otherly imagination, imagining the nation, but from the perspective of the other by being other regarding, by being other accommodating, by accommodating the differences, the pluralities, the dissensions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, my suggestion would be that a divided nation can imagine itself by inverting the gaze of imagination rather than a self-same gaze where one tries to figure out how to imagine one's own nationhood. My submission is that what if we try to imagine, especially since we are trying to imagine a nation that is divided, that is uh, rife with differences and pluralities, what if others with others, what if we invert the gaze and try to imagine through the eyes of the other, through the imagination of others. This is precisely what I mean by talking about otherly imagination, what I'm calling today otherly imagination. So could we derive a toolkit of imagining divided Bengal, not from our own gaze, but from what we learn from how others have imagined Bengal? Could we look at how others have imagined Bengal and from that, from this otherly gaze, derive a toolkit for an 
otherly imagination, an ethical imagination, which automatically therefore would be one that conceives of the nation, imagines of the nation, but through differences, through pluralities. And herein, uh, this is where I said I would slightly truncate and depart from what I promised in my abstract. In my abstract, I suggested that I would look at early European travelers and also later Bengali nationalists. I've left that last part out for the simple reason that we are more familiar with them and it got too long and the point would be made in any case. So today I'll focus only on what I, uh, half of what I promised in my abstract, but that would be good enough. So today, therefore, I will look at, since the idea is to look at how Bengal has been imagined from the eyes of the other and through which I want to derive a toolkit whereby we can imagine our divided nation, I will today look at early modern European travelers to Bengal and how they represented Bengal and how they opened up Bengal to, and herein I use three words and uh, all three would need elaboration and they will be elaborated, extra-colonial and pre-colonial, polycolonial European imagination. I'll come to the word polycolonial in a minute because extra-colonial and pre-colonial are probably self-explanatory. That is uh, those Europeans who did not ever have a colony in Bengal and uh, those who did have colonies, but we are talking about travelers who came before the colonies were established. But polycolonial might require a little bit of explanation, but that is uh, that is a word that I use. And as it was mentioned, that's uh, the title of uh, one of my books also, but I'll just come to it. So. What I intend to do today is I look at a few early modern, very early, often, almost late medieval, starting from late medieval European travelers who came to Bengal, wrote about Bengal, and we'll see, we'll try to see whether from this imagination of Bengal, of the other, can we from this derive a template through which we can now imagine ourselves, but not from our self-same glance, but rather we conceive of a plural and inclusive nation having viewed it through the lens of the other, through an otherly imagination. So that being my agenda, first maybe a note about polycoloniality, since uh, this is uh, something that I've been working on and this is something that ought to be probably explained right at the beginning. What I mean by polycoloniality, and this is just, uh, just the cover of uh, my book, Polycoloniality, which was about European transactions with Bengal from the 13th to the 19th century. What I mean by polycoloniality is that Bengal was not colonized by the English alone. Of course, the English were the major colonizers, and they were pretty much colonizers in Bengal from 1650 to 1947, and in some parts of India from 1611, but they were not the only ones, because Bengal was also colonized by the Portuguese, who were here from 1514 to 1797, and in some parts of India for longer than that, the Dutch, who were here from 1620 to 1825 with formal colonies, the French who had a formal colony, a couple of formal colonies in Bengal from 1670 to 1950 in some parts of uh, India even longer than that. The Danish, I will not read the dates and uh, spend time because this is, I'm just trying to explain the term polycolonial rather than necessarily this being very germane to my talk today. And even the Germans, the Austrians and the Prussians who also had uh, settled colonies in Bengal and uh, some others like Sweden and Greeks who traded with Bengal, maybe not with formal settled colonies, but even prior to this, even prior to the Portuguese, we have had a steady flow of European travelers right from the late 13th to the 16th centuries. And that is what I would focus on today. So very early pre-colonial, extra-colonial European travelers and how they wrote about Bengal and how this, what kind of a model, what kind of a toolkit of imagining Bengal can be derived from their works. So that is precisely what I'm going to talk about today. So who were these early modern European travelers to Bengal? So I've classified them into two categories, the extra-colonials and the pre-colonials, as I've said. So within the extra-colonials, I have included three Italians, the Italian Marco Polo, who probably would have visited, if at all he did visit Bengal, if he just wrote about Bengal, that would be even more of an imagination then. Uh, so which would probably, so if one argues, but, but 
probably Marco Polo wrote from secondary sources. It's possible, it's possible. But if it did come to Bengal, it must have been in the 1270s or so, definitely before 1290. And the little square bracket things is the bibliographical data of the particular edition that I would follow because I'll be quoting from the text themselves. So giving page numbers and all. So I, I'm just also giving the particular edition that I'm following. But anyway, the extra colonials that I take up today are Marco Polo and who in chapter 42 of book two uh, of his uh, the travels of uh, of travels of Marco Polo the Venetian he uh, writes a whole chapter uh, which is uh, which is uh, on uh, Bengal and we will just come to it we'll uh, we'll have an opportunity to quote the second the second Italian is Niccolo Conti and he traveled through Bengal in the 1430s and his travels of Niccolo Conti which was published in 1444 uh, also bears his representation of Bengal we'll come to it we'll not uh, when I do come to the actual travelogues I will not go author by author, I'll go theme by theme, because my objective is not to really study the authors today, which we could do some other day, but to derive a template. So almost to crystallize, call out certain points from their writings. And the third Italian that I pick up, and these were the earliest Europeans who came to Bengal and wrote about it, which is Ludovico di Vartema, who came to Bengal around 1505. And he has two chapters in his The Travels of Ludovico di Vartema on Bengal. Uh, and this is, this is very important. And these people I call extra colonials because they were all Italians, as you can see. And Italy never came to have a colonial presence in Bengal or anywhere in the subcontinent for that matter. Though, and this again, I put in square brackets because this is just a curiosity. Again, not at all germane to my talk today. The Italians came very close to having a colony in the subcontinent because they wanted to buy off Nicobar Islands. Nicobar Islands was a Danish colony. They wanted to buy off Nicobar Islands uh, from 1864 onwards, but they failed and the English finally bought it, but that's quite besides the point. But these are the three early almost late medieval, I'm still calling them early modern for uh, for the sake of uh, homogeneity, but uh, these are the three early Italian extra colonial travelers that I'll take up, as indeed I'll take up a few pre-colonial travelers, that is travelers from those countries which came to have colonies in Bengal, but these travelers would have come before those colonies were established. And I will uh, look into Duarte Barbosa, the Portuguese Duarte Barbosa, who uh, uh, writes an entire article, Article 102 in Volume 2, in his the book of Duarte Barbosa on Bengal. And the uh, I mean, I'll mention two Frenchmen, but Vassal Leblanc, he was the first Frenchman to come to Bengal, and which was in 1575. And again, he has a chapter uh, on Bengal in his travelogue. The Dutch. So these are the first port Portugal, French, uh, Netherlands, and England did have colonies in Bengal, but these travelers would have preceded the establishment of those colonies, and therefore I call them pre-colonials. The Dutch, Jan Huygen van Linschoten, and he visited Bengal around the 1580s, and again he has a full chapter on Bengal in his travelogue. And the first Englishman to come to India was Ralph Fitch, the most curious character. Someday probably we can have a whole session on Ralph Fitch alone. But nevertheless, Ralph Fitch visited Bengal twice in 1586 and 1588-89. And uh, again, he has written on Bengal and we'll, we'll talk about it. And again, one more Frenchman who visited somewhat late, I mean, later compared to the other people in 1607, Francois Pirat de Laval, but even that is before the French had colonies. So he's still pre-colonial colonies in Bengal. Uh, so Francois Pirat de Laval, and he also documented his short trip to Bengal. He came only to almost pass through Chattogram rather than really visiting Bengal very majorly. And these, of course, I call pre-colonials because they are from, and I've explained it, so um, I mean, you know what I mean. So they are indeed from Portugal, the Netherlands, England, and France, which did become major players in polycolonial Bengal, having proper colonies in Bengal for significant lengths of time. But the travelers, because uh, Portu Portugal had its first colony in Bengal in 1514, the Dutch had its first colonies, uh, colony in Bengal in 1623, the English had their first colony in Hooghly in 1650, and the French in 1673, but the travelers, they came before any of these countries, each of their own countries, that is, would set up a colony. So therefore, I call them pre-colonials. But uh, without, without uh, going into, without unnecessarily delaying things uh, much further, let me now straight away move to what I do intend to uh, talk about today, which is the themes, the themes that emerge in these 
otherly imaginations of Bengal. These imaginations of Bengal, these accounts of Bengal, which would open up or construct or imagine Bengal as a space, but from the other's case. And these themes themselves will form the toolkit that I talked about uh, for trying to be other regarding in this alternative uh, visualization imagination of the nation. So what are the themes? So these are the eight themes. I list eight themes before you and take them up one after the uh, other. So first, I see quite a lot of foregrounding in these works, in these accounts by the travelers that I've listed before you of the rich history and geography of Bengal. I'll come to, I'll elaborate all these points by actually quoting the authors. Second, we see that in these authors, there is some focus on the language of Bengal, on the customs of Bengal. We also see a lot of talk about the prosperity of Bengal. Obviously, that is aimed more towards enticing the pre-colonials, enticing their nations to come because it's such a prosperous space. But nevertheless, prosperity of Bengal gets talked about. The grand cities of Bengal, there is a lot of talk about Bengal having grand cities. And also not just cities, but also the diverse, the diversity of the hinterland of interior Bengal. That also gets talked about. Cosmopolitanism gets talked about in terms of how Bengal is a melting pot, is a place where people from different communities and different nationalities and different ethnicities can come together and live together peacefully and rub shoulders together. But there is also in all these works, or quite a few of these works, a focus on problematic communal Hindu-Muslim relations, problematic caste relations, which already in the 1500s were visible to uh, these travelers. And uh, also, therefore, the eighth theme that I find amongst these uh, early modern, pre-colonial, extra-colonial, uh, otherly imaginations of Bengal is a possible dark side of Bengal too. So I'll take you through these themes one after the other. Moving to the first theme, which is the rich history and geography of Bengal, we find that Vassal Lablon, so one of the early French travelers who came to Bengal in 1575, he actually connects Bengal, or at least the capital of Bengal, the chief city of Bengal, who, which he goes on to say that the chief town of the kingdom of Bengal bears the same name. That is Bengal. It's called the town of Bengal also. That is a debatable thing as to why traveler after traveler would refer to a city of Bengal. But I don't want to go into that toponymic uh, debate at this point of time. But uh, he also says that the natives call that place Batakuta. And he goes on to say, this is the Ganga, the city Ganga of antiquity. And uh, which, as we as we do know, that uh, in Greco-Roman history, particularly in Plutarch and Pliny, we have uh, this mention of this Ganga Delta kingdom called Ganga Ride, and apparently whose uh, possible threat uh, made Alexander retreat. And there's a lot of uh, quasi history surrounding it. But nevertheless, so Vassal Abnot directly draws today's, I mean, not today's, I mean, late 16th century Bengal, to that Bengal of antiquity by directly saying without, I believe, much historical justification. Because as I go on to say that, uh, it is very difficult to sustain whether the chief town of Bengal at that point of time would indeed have been Gange. Uh, which Gange is the name of the chief town of Bengal that uh, in antiquity gets mentioned. And Batakuta, I mean, well, it does sound almost like Wadi Bateshwar, which is where the Ganga and also Chandragitu, and that, that has got no phonetic resemblance, but nevertheless. Uh, but the point that I also make is that while uh, Ganga Ride, the, the original historical antique city of Bengal, uh, whose archaeological evidence have been found in either Wadi Bateshwar or in Chandragitu in West Bengal, but neither of them were really towns of any significance in Vassola Blanc's time. So this historical identification is imagined. It is deeply suspect. But nevertheless, the point to be noted is that Vassola Blanc wants to draw this kind of a provenance for Bengal by connecting it to what his readership would be familiar with, that this is that very place, that Gangari there, that Gange, that our antique historians Plutarch Pliny have talked about. Uh, similarly, when Marco Polo talks about Bengal, and uh, this is for the first time when he mentions Bengal, this is in chapter 42 uh, of his, and I've given uh, page numbers also wherever um, I have quoted, 
So uh, here I've not quoted, so I've just mentioned it. But uh, in uh, chapter 42 of book two, he talks about a battle that happened between Kublai Khan himself, the Grand Khan. In 1272, apparently there was a battle between him and the King of Mien and Bengal. And this is how he spells Bengal. The spelling will vary from text to text. Again, my su uh, submission is that there is no historical evidence of Kublai Khan's uh, army ever having fought a battle with any King of Bengal. But maybe, and Mien is of course the name of uh, Myanmar. So it is possible that maybe the King of Myanmar may have, uh, and because of the contiguity between Burma and Bengal may have styled himself as the king of Mian and Bengal, king of Mian and Bangla, by having uh, occupied a certain part of what would be considered Bengal. But anyway, though historically it may be severely doubted whether Kublai Khan ever fought a battle with the king of Bengal, the point that I'm trying to underscore is that Bengal was imagined by Marco Polo uh, and his readers as consequential enough having historical relevance enough to have actually had a fight with Kublai Khan. Similarly, we find Ludovico de Vartema, also this, this grandiose kind of a historicity being accorded to, uh, to Bengal in these early writings. So uh, he, uh, Ludovico de Vartema talks about how the Sultan of Bengal maintained a huge army and uh, it, uh, Again, it, it's probably hyperbole, but nevertheless, it's possible. But there's this historical catapulting of the imagined Bengal onto a certain kind of a provenance. And that is the point that I'm trying to make. Similarly, geographically also, there is an attempt to build, open up this landscape of Bengal in grand terms. And Niccolo Conti, very interestingly, gives a wide sweep of the subcontinent. He says that India, the subcontinent that is, can be divided into three zones. So from Persia to Indus, which is roughly Afghanistan, Pakistan today, right? Then from Indus to Ganga, which is the Hindi belt, basically. And then whatever lies east of Ganga. So he calls Bengal the entire region that lies east of Ganga. And he also says that this is the third part. Uh, I'll come to it later also. He says this is this part excels the other two parts and uh, excels in terms of its significance, whatever it is. But geographically, there is a demarcation of what constitutes Bengal in this very early 15th century imagining of Bengal, 15th century writing of Bengal and consequent imagining of Bengal, and also a certain degree of superlativeness gets ascribed to it. Similarly, Conti also talks about the river Ganga, the Delta Ganga, and how large it is. I can't go into further details because obviously these travelogues are fairly detailed, but nevertheless, this is the first register, the first theme that I wanted to pick up, where Bengal gets presented by these early modern European authors as having grand historical and geographical provenance. To move on to the second theme, which is how these writers refer to language and customs of Bengal, Marco Polo, uh, very interestingly, he talks about the peculiar language of Bengal. Now, well, we, we would probably uh, take pride in our peculiarity, but nevertheless, that the peculiarity of the language, that the specificity of the language will be marked so early on, we are talking about 1270s, 1280s, is indeed noteworthy. Similarly, talking about customs, Marco Polo talks about, and every writer ethnographically does talk about what the people eat, how the people dress. I'm not going to further details, but I'm trying to focus on the word abundance, and which will indeed inform the next register that I'll move on to. But Marco Polo talks about the food habit of the people, and which he also talks about in terms of abundance. But Niccolo Conti, I mean, who we already have seen having almost given one third of the subcontinent to Bengal, so to say, and that which excels all other parts. So Niccolo Conti, talking about the customs of the people, he is very exaggerated because I find it very difficult even today to identify with what he says. And this is a longish quote, but... Uh, I can just point out some of the key words there. So uh, obviously the third part excels the others in riches, politeness. And he also says that uh, it's almost European. 
because and that is that is the point so they have furniture and they are they do not have any of the barbarity and coarseness so a uh, bengali is suddenly being projected in the 15th century as being not just humane but also they use tables at their meals this is where a slight doubt uh, comes in as to who exactly was conti talking about but nevertheless the rest of india it just sits on the floor and eats bengal eats at tables right and therefore according to conti in conti this imagination this third part of india that which lies eastward of ganga is the best part of the subcontinent so customs getting talked about probably in a bit exaggerated way language being talked about probably only by ascribing peculiarities uh, to it uh, incidentally ralph fitch gives an even more curious incidents which probably was restricted only to the hindus of kuch bihar which he visits but he talks about how bengal had hospitals for animals and how it would take again it is probably exaggerated but nevertheless a certain image of this hospitable very very kind bengalis and yet very uh, let's say polite and very uh, very uh, with table manners and speaking this quaint peculiar tongue so there is a construction of the language and customs of bengal in a particular way and in a charitable way in a complimentary way which is the second theme that i can call out from these works a third theme that i've mentioned is this prosperity of bengal evidently all these works projected bengal to be fairly prosperous that's quite uh, understandable marco polo himself and a lot of talk would be about the agricultural produce and the trade marco polo talks about how cotton and ginger and sugar and how merchants from all over the world come over so bengal is a very prosperous space ludovico di varthema two centuries and more uh, after uh, after marco polo uh, also talks about how this country abounds more in grain in flesh and, and everything and abundance of cotton than any country in the world so bengal being the most prosperous country in the world or, or at least and having the richest merchants that at least ludovico di vattema met so again a lot of hyperbole a lot of exaggeration but the uh, the construction the imagination by the other of bengal is indeed in terms of its unbelievable prosperity which we should probably take with a pinch of salt but nevertheless it's pretty much there similarly the dutch traveler jan huygen van leen schouten he also talks about this plentifulness i also highlighted the word abundance earlier in the marco polo quote and he talks about jute which uh, it's a longish quote and i would not read it because uh, uh, jute which he calls the herb of bengalen Uh, somewhere in the fourth line or so of my indented uh, quote but uh, so this curious place which produces this wonderful fabric called yellowish fabric called jute etc so a lot of focus on the agricultural produce of bengal the richness of bengal the prosperity of bengal and similarly ralph fitch also talks about a cotton of bengal and uh, ralph fitch further focuses on how uh, this region is almost an epicenter of trade of trade around south east asia uh, around the entire let's say indian ocean the eastern bay of bengal rim so to say so bengal being projected as this uh, extremely prosperous place as an epicenter of trade now uh, so far so good that was the third register i'll come back to these eight registers one after the other and what do we have to learn from these in trying to derive our own otherly imagination fourth as i've already mentioned all these or most of these travelers they come to cities in bengal and they marvel at the grandness of these cities nicolo conti talks about two cities that he passes through he names them sernovi and bufetania now sernovi almost certainly is sher now or the new city shahor nabo a sher now which tada got named as once gor i mean later gor cap the Gour, it was not in conti's time but the capital of gor would be shifted to tada uh, but whatever but bufetania one doesn't know maybe patna there there's been a lot of onomastic analysis but nevertheless uh, conti talks about this grand cities and cities which he really describes in extremely urban terms Similarly, Ludovico di Varthema, who, as you remember, is given to hyperboles because he talked about Bengal being the richest country, the merchants in Bengal being the richest. So no wonder he talks about the city of Bengal, which is probably Gaur in all probability, which was the capital at that, that point of time. He says this city was the best that I'd hitherto seen, and best in the world, best city in the world. 
world. So Bengal having these in the 16th century, mind you, these fantastic urban spaces, which these European travelers marvel at. Similarly, Duarte Barbosa also talks about the city of Bengal, but the location would be slightly different. And it seems that he may have been talking about Chottogram because uh, which is uh, north to the right side of a gulf that goes in. It cannot be Gaur. Gaur is too inland, uh, but whatever it is. So which city each traveler would call as the city of Bengal may depend on which city he landed in. But nevertheless, Duarte Barbosa also talks about this great urban, big urban setups in Bengal. So there's a lot of focus on this big urban uh, set, uh, settlements. And Jan Huygen van Lin Schouten also talks about both Chattogram and Hubli, the Porto Grande and the Porto Pequino, the grand port and the small port, uh, uh, as the Portuguese would call them. And uh, again, he describes them with the awe and marvel of how fantastic these urban spaces are. So this is my fourth register, lest we forget, the fourth theme that emerges from these early modern European imaginations. The fifth is that beyond the cities and beyond the prosperous trading centers, some of these travelers, actually Ralph Fitch alone probably, also goes into the hinterland of Bengal, into the interior of Bengal. And there, however, we see diversity. We see utter diversity. And Ralph Fitch, actually, rather than sticking to the usual circuit, the usual European circuit of Tara, Shadgao, Hubli, Chattogram, he he goes to far flung areas like he goes to Kuch Bihar, something that I mentioned already. So he actually travels into Kuch, what he calls Kuch, which is Kuch Bihar. He probably travels to Bhutan or definitely writes about Bhutan, which is just to the north of North Bengal, uh, which uh, pretty much on I mean, the Duars area is pretty much contiguous with Bengal. And he talks about how from Kuch, uh, there is a four days journey and we can go to this country called Bhutantar and whose city is called Bhutia and where you see mountains. So going quite into the hinterland, quite into the interior and the hinterland, he also went to Tripura or the port of Tripura, as he calls it, but Tripura generally, and which is also very interesting. So uh, Ralph Fitch travels and describes the interior of Bengal. And there, and also relatively smaller port towns like Hijli, which he calls Anjali, which was called Anjali, and also Bakla, uh, which could be Bakirganj for all we know. Uh, but uh, anyway, so he visits small, rather than the usual Tara, uh, Hugli, Chattogram circuit, he visits the interior of Bengal, small towns of Bengal, the hinterland of Bengal. And he also visits interior big towns rather than only port towns and only the capital towns where the Europeans would usually flock. He, he also visited Sripur and Shonargaon. And he has a lot to write about these curious places. Imagine in the 1580s, an Englishman walking into these small demi-urban interior spaces and he describes the utter diversity and which is not really in tandem with the cosmopolitan grandeur of those grand port cities. Uh, furthermore, however, uh, Ralph Fitch also notices the political instability of interior Bengal. So when we come to the interior Bengal, a slightly different picture emerges. And he talks about uh, Isha Khan, and he talks about how whole of Bengal was at that point of time under Akbar, but there would be a lot of rebelliousness and Zalab Dim Akbar. That's how Ralph Fitch, and in fact, Queen Elizabeth, by the way, this is an absolute aside. I really do not have the time to go to asides, but nevertheless, uh, Queen Elizabeth I actually wrote a letter to Zalabdin Akbar, and which Ralph Fitch and his company carried to Akbar's court in Fatehpur Sikri. But that's quite besides the point. And that, again, we could discuss on some other day. Uh, but anyway, so Zalabdin Akbar, Jalaluddin Akbar, basically, he was supposed to have whole of Bengal under his control. But you go to interior Bengal, there is lawlessness or there are there are uh, strives, there are uh, independent. We are, we are all aware of the Barugmiya. We are all aware of uh, the uh, internecine, uh, rebellious uh, chieftains, etc., etc. So Ralph Fitch brings that to our attention. To move on to the sixth register, that is cosmopolitanism, how, because of this diversity, probably, Bengal is already imagined as a diverse cosmopolitan place where different ethnicities rub shoulders with each other. Into Ludovico di Barthema very early notices how in Sarno, which is 
could be Sheherno or it could be wherever, it doesn't matter. He comes across some Christian merchants, but that's okay. But who are Armenian in all probability? So we already find Armenians. And this is, we are talking in Ludovico de Vartema's time. So that is like 16th century, uh, early, very early 16th century. Similarly, Vassola Blanc says how th there is absolute plurality in Bengal. So the inhabitants, they are idolaters and Muslims, some Christians. And of course, he talks about how there are Persians. Greeks, Abyssinians, Chinese, Gujaratis, Malabaris, that is Keralites, Turks, Moors, Jews, Russians, Georgians, all congregate in Bengal. So we already have an imagining of this very fluid, very plural cosmopolitan space. Similarly, Duarte Barbosa uh, also talks about the cosmopolitan nature, and he also mentions uh, not just white men, but also Arabs, Persians, Habshis, Abyssinians, and Hab Hab um, that is uh, generally Africans, but uh, Ethiopians, let's say. And he talks how both Arabic, so there are two trade routes, mind you. One is the maritime route, which the Arabs had, and which the Europeans will take on later. And also the land route, which is the Chinese route, the Silk Road, as opposed to the Spice Route. And it seems that Bengal was at the confluence of both these routes, both the China sort and the Arab sort. And both kinds of vessels, both kinds of uh, trading posts would be seen there. And this Ralph, which also knows, because he talks about how there'll be merchants from China, Moscow, Tartary. So basically, not just the not just the the sea route, not just the spice route, but Bengal being almost at this confluence at the crossroads of maritime trade and land trade, but generally a very cosmopolitan space, a very plural space. The seventh register that I must force, I'm keeping a tab on my uh, watch too. And I'm close, I'm coming very close to the close of my talk. We are already in the second last register, as you can see. So the uh, seventh register is, however, still in spite of this plurality, in spite of this cosmopolitanism, the probable strife amongst Hindus and Muslims, even then, or the probable differences does not miss the foreign visitor's eye. And Duarte Barbosa talks about the immense difference, economic difference between the Muslims who control the mercantile trade and the inhabitants who stay inland. And Barbosa also talks about slave trade. And he goes on to suggest that there is this communal tension because apparently the Moorish merchants, they kidnap Hindu boys and castrate them and sell them off as slaves, which could have been historically true. The point that I'm noting is that we have to be conversant with the problems also. And that is exactly uh, what would help me in building my toolkit in a minute. And he talks about, uh, Barbosa also talks about uh, cost. He directly mentions lower cost, the word lower cost was the end of the quote uh, that I've given here and how there is therefore a lot of uh, social stratification. And Barbosa also talks about conversion and how there was a problem. He notes this problem uh, at the beginning of the 16th century in Bengal. So in short, the problems of communal strife, caste relations also doesn't escape these uh, foreign uh, imaginings, early modern European imaginings, and which probably lead me, leads me to the last register, which is the dark side of Bengal, and which also these, uh, these early, uh, other early imaginations uh, show us. On the one hand, there is slave trade. I've already talked about how Bengal was this epicenter of slave trade, and Marco Polo also draws our attention to slave trade in Bengal. I'm not going to read the quote, but uh, it is inhuman, as we can see. Similarly, Niccolo Conti uh, actually witnesses an act of sati. And uh, we all know the whole, uh, the abominable act of Sati. And he has a longish quote, a graphic description. Again, I won't read the quote. I simply don't have the time, but the uh, page number is there. Those who want to look up, it's a graphic description of the hapless widow being burnt on her husband's fire. So these darker sides of Bengal also come up in the imaginations of the Europeans. And uh, Ralph Fitch also points out towards the lawlessness, because when he was supposed to go from Kujbihar to Hooghly, rather than taking the usual route, he takes a more circuitous route because otherwise there are many thieves. 
And in fact, the Bengali people are also some of the some of these European writers have a rather uncharitable views of the Bengali people. Uh, Jan Jürgen van Lien Schouten, for instance, talks about the Bengalis as being the most subtle and wicked people, and their the women are all whores, the men are all cheats, etc. And as Francois Pirard de Laval also goes on to say that the women, uh, and so if, if the the quote is right in front of you. So the men are cheats and the women are whores. So so this kind of a darker side of a Bengal also gets brought up in these writings. So now to conclude and to come to the end of my uh, time, as well as uh, as I can uh, no. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> For a moment, I got lost between Bangladesh time and yes, I'm indeed uh, towards the end of my time and I'm towards the end of my slides too. So what are the lessons that we learn from these otherly imaginations of Bengal? To go through those eight things again, first, what toolkit, I was talking about a toolkit, what toolkit do we derive from this, the historical perusal of these others' imaginings of Bengal? First of all, and I'm moving exactly down those eight themes, we can surely take pride in the rich history and the awe-inspiring geography of Bengal. There is no doubt about that. We should, we ought to. We must cherish our unique language and customs. Indeed, we ought to reminisce on the prosperity of Bengal and celebrate the big cities and the flourishing trade. We indeed must do that. But we should also accept, as we saw in the fourth register, we should accept the diversity of the interior regions of Bengal and be responsive to the plurality that Bengal is all about. And this particularly because Bengal has been, as we saw in these accounts, the cradle of tolerance, the cradle of cosmopolitanism. So we ought to be responsive to pluralities and difference because otherwise, as we saw, communal tension and caste problems, they're just lurking around the corner. And it can flare into sectarianism at any point of time, as indeed in South Asia we have seen continuously. And this would thrust us into the darker side, which is marked with fundamentalism, intolerance, hypocrisy, oppression of minorities, violence. And we don't want to go to the dark side. So this is the toolkit that we got. So basically, one should arm one's alterity-oriented imagination, and one should in imagine the nation of Bengal as an inclusive and plural nation through a toolkit that I gave you, which is developed itself, not through our own self, same imagination of ourselves, but rather an imagination of Bengal from the perspective of the others. So to finally conclude, I was talking about Bengal imagining a divided nation. And we started with the question, can a divided nation like Bengal be imagined? That was, that was, of course, the question. And it seems, finally, at the end of uh, this, not only can it be, but in fact, our divisions, our pluralities, our continuous co-presence with others is probably the greatest strength of ours in imagining ourselves as a nation. So rather than it being a debilitating hindrance, that we are divided is our greatest wealth because that allows us to be other regarding, that allows us to be embracing of plurality, embracing of alterities. And therefore we can be a nation divided as we are, we can be a nation that can never be monolithic and jingoistic because we are not monolithic to begin with. We are a divided nation. And we don't, think, and so there is no Bengal as a political state. So the question of a jingoistic oppressive state machinery of the nation of Bengal doesn't arise. And this is our greatest wealth. Because we are a divided nation, we can probably imagine it's only an imagined nation. Bengal is only an imagined nation. And because it is imagined, it is already always imagined, as I or rather we ought to imagine it beyond jingoisms, beyond sectarianisms, beyond monisms at the altar of alterity. This other regarding, other imagining nation, otherly imagination, an alter nation, as I called it. So uh, this, is, this is practically uh, the end of my talk. And I thank you very much. And uh, my wishes to all of you on the uh, 50th anniversary of Bangladesh's uh, independence and the 70th anniversary of the Bhasha Shahid Dibosh. Joy Bangla. Thank you. I said, uh, Professor Bhajari, forgive me. Professor Bhajari, that was a supercharged talk. And I think the audience was quite transfixed. Uh, I certainly was. And I was not looking at the time from time to time, which you seem to suggest. I was doing other things which we shall not discuss at this moment. 
uh, just to go on with your sense yeah, of humor. No, no, I didn't yeah, suggest you were looking at the time. I, I suggested it was an auto suggestion that I ought to look at the time. And I think I did a good job. I, uh, I did, I did keep a tab of time myself. Excellent. You did a fabulous job, Professor. And my compliments to that. Uh, just to wrap up very quickly, but unfortunately, uh, a keynote, we don't have a provision for a question, but you seem to have answered all uh, the questions that you yourself raised. But I'll just sort of, sort of wrap up very, very quickly because we are now running out of time. Uh, some of the key takeaways, because you did, unfortunately, didn't have the time to elaborate on the second aspect of your talk. So if you'll permit me to just sort of inject a little bit of uh, pressy there. Uh, I, you know, I take these two, uh, four key takeaways, not like your eight point toolkit, but a four point takeaway kit. Uh, I mean, you did very, very emphatically uh, point out in the beginning, which uh, but the irony of language dominance, which I think is a very, very important thing that we in what I like to call Bangla sphere need to keep in mind, whether it's in the Indian Bangla sphere or the Bangladeshi Bangla sphere, if you will, or elsewhere. And then you very, very uh, emphatically suggest uh, inclusion. And, you know, in, and there is also an unsaid suggestion, which you elaborated on later, where you actually, you know, without saying it in as many words, said that, you know, this is essentially Bengalis have to own up to the liberalism that they claim for themselves. Uh, essentially, that was your uh, hook uh, to the Bengali nation or the divided Bengali nation, as it were. When you, and it was very interesting when you talked about the polycolonial uh, aspects of Bengal, which many people don't realize has happened. And uh, here I, am, I'm, uh, I can't help but quip that, as you would know, because you expanded so much on the historical aspect as well of, of Bengal, that we were at a time we came so close that we could have well had this entire conference in French instead of English. You could have been speaking in French and I could be re responding to you in French. We came that close to, to that denouement. And uh, see, I, I'm picking up on straight French myself. Uh, and there you talk about the dark side, which is very, very relevant, uh, which we, again, I think in our hubris, we tend to, as Bengali people, as Bengali nations uh, in Bangladesh, we tend to sort of put aside, which I'm very happy that you brought to the fore, and uh, the dark side of Bengal is indeed well established, and it's sort of a, it fast forwards in a way to the present day. So thank you very much for setting that tone. And here I cannot, but uh, I was hoping that you would mention this gentleman's name, but you stuck to the European. So let me introduce a Moroccan. Uh, Moroccan. Uh, Ibn Battuta, after all, did describe Bengal as a hell, as a hell full of good things. So in a way, uh, Ibn Battuta basically, in a pre-colonial sense, sums up your talk of today. Uh, and thank you, Professor, for a very sobering and yet uh, mapping a sobering past and present, and yet mapping a very hopeful future for Bengal and the Bengali nation, united or divided or as we have it. So thanks very much for that absolutely engaging conversation. And I'm sure uh, we at ULAB uh, will have you back again and again uh, for more interactions. Be well and joy Bangla, as you said, I echo that. Thank you very much again uh, to Professor Bhaduri and uh, to uh, all of us, the audience uh, and in Dhaka and all over the world. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. The pleasure was mine and surely we'll, our paths shall cross again sometime. Indeed. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you so much, Professor Shahzata Badhuri, for that extremely engaging session and Professor Shudhir Chakraborty for chairing that session. Um, we have two minutes um, before our next session, because coming up next is the plenary lecture and performance, and it starts exactly at 11 a.m. So perhaps we can have a break of two minutes before we start. Please don't go anywhere, and um, we will resume the session very shortly. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Aswar Hussain and Professor Afsan Choudhury for joining us. Dear audience, we have parallel sessions going on at the moment. Like yesterday, um, there are three different rooms, room one, room two, room three. The links have been posted in the chat. Do join the session of your choice. Paper presenters, if you have not gone into your room already, you're requested to do so right now. Thank you so much. I will see you again in the main room at um, 2.30 p.m. for our final plenary session uh, of the day with Dr. Christine Hone from Maastricht University and Dr. Abhishek Parui from IIT Madras. Thank you so much. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.